This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at thebatmanuniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to the Batman Universe Comics Podcast, Season 14, Episode 23, Second to Last Episode of the Year. I'm your host, Ian. And this is Dev. Um, this is Dev. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> hey, Mike. Oh, Are you okay, Theo? Stop, I mute the mic because I, 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 sometimes I hate when background noise gets in, especially when it's the four-legged uh, child. I love <laughs> the four-legged noise. Yeah. noise. <laughs> Mike. All right. So we have no news today, but we have two reviews because last week was an annual week. So we've got a bunch of stuff to review. So let's get started on Detective Comics Annual 2022. Written by Ram V, art by Raphael Albuquerque, Christopher Mitten, and Hayden Sherman. We open as the Orgum agent Gale, who is a werewolf, talking to Shavad, who has very strange eyes, walking through the ruins of Arkham Asylum, their family's new purchase, and they speak of their Queen Daria's plans within plans. Gale says he was alive and present at Gotham's founding, centuries prior to the raising of the church that became Arkham Asylum. They dig up a glowing artifact Gale buried in 1776, and the scene flashes back to that time. The settlement of Gatholm is rocked by violent deaths, which a witness says are a werewolf's work. Pastor Ichabod Crane preaches that the wolf attacks because there is no church and the town witch uh, is responsible. Garrett Jarden, an older man, attacks Crane to protect Ayana, the witch and Ojibwe medicine woman, and Crane says his benefactor, Lord Ethaniel Orgum, has come to pay for a church if the town is cleaned up. At Ayana's home, Joe Proctor accuses her of being a witch and threatens to burn her. War veteran Crean Pierce violently disperses the mob, and Ayanna tends to his wounds afterwards. Bandit Lord Darcy Hunt, with a scar across half his face, preaches his own gospel of honest thievery against the coming deception of commerce. The lord of that commerce, Lord Orgum, meets with Pastor Crane and the merchant Pebblecroft, revealing that his servant Gale is behind the murders the trigger for his plans, creating fear, which will lead to power through the church and commerce, using the glowing artifact called the Reality Engine to manipulate the patterns so Gotham will be stuck in those cycles for all time, as well as murdering Jardin, Orgum's rival for power. Pierce takes the son of the murdered Wainwrights, the last scion of the family which founded the town, away from Gotham to give the boy peace. But the wagon driver, who calls himself Mordecai, among other names, urges him to stay in Gotham and fight for what is right. Joe Proctor and the mob return to uh, capture Ayanna, plotting to burn her. But Pierce returns on a burning wagon, masked as a fearsome bat, and defeats the mob. Ayanna says she called his name Barbatos, and they plan to fight the robber Darcy Hunt by driving him into Ayanna's forest which will destroy them with her magic. Pierce lights a fire to drive bats into the town to terrify the bandits. Hunt is about to murder Jardin, but Pierce Batman staves him. In the present, Gale says the reality engine accidentally caught the Batman in its pattern, destroying the Orgum's plans, 
So they plan to remove Batman from the equation forever. We see Queen Daria Orgum opening a box with a severed tongue and two eyeballs. And Gail and Shavad lay their plans to destroy Batman and retake Gotham for the Orgums. So, for me, this issue really sort of unlocked a lot of what's been going on for the last um, five issues. Or is it six issues? Many. I think it's, it's not that many. Um, what about for you? How did how did this change your perception, or did this change your perception of the the opening two pieces we've had of this issue, this arc? I don't know. Not really. I mean, it it showed that there's the past history with, I guess, Barbados and the whatever family, Orgam Farm family. I I feel like it happened a long time ago. We should probably let things go. <laughs> I don't know. I don't quite understand. No, it did nothing. It, it just made me a little bit more confused, I guess. Now there's motivation? Question mark? Not really. I don't know. It's stupid. I don't care. I don't know. Fair. Fair. Um, does it add something to the story? Yeah, I guess. Um, but I really think it gets lost in the overall story. It, I don't know if, if the annual was the best place to put it because, I mean, you, 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 you have this, this one point, this one notion of this is why we're here. and. It gets lost in all this other stuff, which just seems like unneeded fluff. For me, this felt like a key. Um, I was just so lost. I didn't understand what the Orgums wanted. I didn't understand what they were trying to do to Batman. And this reveals all of that. It shows that the Orgums were among the founders of Gotham, and they had this weird reality-bending plan to, like, make Gotham their stronghold city forever. But Batman got in the way, and so now they want to remove him so they can regain the power. Now, it'd be nice if Ram V gives us some some history on why they've waited till now, you know? Um, But, I don't know, I just feel like we've really got a sense of sort of the wheels within wheels. Or at least two of the wheels. I still don't understand. Like, it just... The, okay. It's... The end conclusion to me was history always repeats itself. And so there's the Batman who was the... the, the every, every character in here in this beginning story has a parallel modern-day character. Ichabod Crane, obviously, is Jonathan Crane. Uh, the witch lady was Ivy, who by the end was dressing in looking exactly like Ivy. Uh, the Alfred slash Batman character was Alfred slash Batman. Uh, and then it, th- near the end, there's this like m- montage of different Batman. Like a, <laughs> was it a pirate Batman maybe? I don't know, kind of looks 1776-ish. And then what looks like Victorian area Batman, and then, I don't know, something. Maybe, I don't know. It's just all these different versions of Batman, and it, I don't know, it cheapened it for me. It's like, Batman is not an original character. He's always existed. Batman was fated to be Batman, and I don't know, it doesn't have a choice. It, it I don't know. The, the, the literal history repeating itself bothered me a lot. Like, it, had this been an Elseworlds story, I would have thought it was pretty cool. But it's not. It's Gotham history, and that acts me off. For all of our too long don't read folks out there, to summarize what my good friend Steph has just said, this was Elseworld. Mm -hmm. I just felt that we were in the midst of a total Elseworld story, which shouldn't exist in continuity. In my opinion, at least, but uh, I don't know. 
Well, that so I want to bring some context here. Um, we were talking a little bit before we started recording about uh, Return of Bruce Wayne and my researches, which I found out after I uh, wrote my review. Uh, indicate that Mordecai, the man who inspires Pierce to don the the helm of the bat, uh, is actually Batman during the Return of Bruce Wayne. Although uh, the timeline doesn't quite work because when Bruce was traveling through time in the Return of Bruce Wayne, uh, I don't think he went through this specific time period. I think they're sort of cheating. Um, how do you how do you feel this compares to? the pieces of this time period that we saw in Return of the Bruce Wayne, and also we all have read together uh, uh, Curse of the White Knight, which also goes through this time period. Um, and that is uh, distinctly in Elseworlds. Like, that's explicitly Elseworlds. Um, do you just don't think that we should tell Batman stories in this time period? Or do you think it's a question of execution? Like, where are your thoughts there? I personally just don't like the idea that Fat Man existed before Fat did. Because to me, Fat Man was an original creation he came up with because he's afraid of Bat. Not because of family history or something that happened in 1776. It's because of his journey. And so I don't like when in canon, I'm all for retelling of stories and having it set in 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 gothic uh, Jack the Ripper Elsewhere. Elsewhere. Yes, those Elsewhere. are those are lovely. Those are fun. But when it's and and this it just it's just how literally cyclical it was because it wasn't just that it was Batman, it was Ivy, it was Crane, it was it was all these other characters. And, and it just I don't know. It just bothers me because it takes the character I love and makes him faded to be who he is. And I d- takes the choice away from me. Yeah, your actual question. But <laughs> I just didn't like the way that incorporated it with the story. And to me, it really doesn't explain at all what, what the Orgums are after. It's just, no, I don't, I don't. Okay, so basically you did answer by saying you think it's not conceptual, it's an execution problem for you. Yeah, like, if they had, yeah. Like, if they had been, like, although this has been done to death, too, the Waynes of the past wronged our family, or the Arkhams of the past wronged our family, or, or what, what's the name of the town? G- Gatham? Uh, Gatholm or something? And there were Gatholm ruined our family legacy. That's all fine. Even having maybe like a vigilante type character, that's fine. But to have it literally be every character have a parallel today, that's just. Well, another thing you just said made something occur to me. We're 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 seeing um, Gotham City Year One, in which there is a Catwoman sort of predecessor. Yeah. And you know what? I was thinking about that as as, as I was reading it. I was like, is it hypocritical critical of me to like this? But but not the Gotham story. And that's, you know what? She was cat burglar running like a cat. I, I, there's a cat woman in, in Spider-Man like that. That's not saying someone is cat like in sort of drawing a little, Oh, look, she's kind of like cat woman is different than literally every character dressing and having the same initials and having the same character design as they do in modern times. like Yeah, I get what you're saying. This feels more like modern-day Gotham cosplaying, whereas, you know, Gotham City Year One has, uh, like, there's a, a lady who jumps off roofs, and she's, like, clearly got a similar, like, structural character DNA as Catwoman. And then, of course, you've got the older mentor Catwoman in um, Batman the Night by Zdarsky. Um, but those aren't, it's not taking place in like a world where it's just, it's, it's like bizarre world. Like you took a bunch of drugs and all of a sudden everyone seems like they're in the past. <laughs> yeah. You know, Yeah. I, I get what you're saying. 
Um, this is not me agreeing. I'm just saying I, I understand where you're coming from, where this friction is coming from. So, Thea, what do you think? Well, I, I can't say it any better than Steph did. You know, as I as I said, you know, with your first question, the notion of Elseworld in continuity just doesn't doesn't sit well with me. You know, and that's part of the reason that I was not a fan of to return to Bruce Wayne, you know, as he go through all these time periods and meet all these other versions of Batman and it's just like, ugh. So, you know, I can't I can't say it any better than what Steph did. It's just it does not sit well. But that is interesting to know because I haven't read that one yet. That Don't worry. that Don't. that this has been done before. Like this isn't necessarily that Rom V is making up the fact that all these Batman have existed in the past. That is technically canon, I guess, at this point. It's, yes. No, I don't like that. <laughs> well, that, that's kind of Morrison. I mean, that's one of the you, reasons I don't like Morrison. You thank Grant Morrison. That's one of the few things I've hated about it to run. That. Thanks, Obama. I mean, Grant Morrison. Oh, my goodness. This guy. <laughs> this went somewhere. <laughs> So, let me let me talk. Are, are, did you say what you wanted to say, Theo? Yeah. Um, okay. Let me talk a little bit about sort of my take because I don't disagree. I think all of what you're saying. Um, if I felt that this run was going to become like the central thing, like if this was, if I thought this was going to be Nightfall or No Man's Land or one of the year ones even where it just becomes a really essential part of a character or Gotham's history. I think I would agree with you. I think I would be frustrated at the, at the fact that it feels like this is, um, is doing a lot of stuff that seems too cyclical. Um, but I, I, I had two pieces about the story that kind of made me like it despite the fact that everyone was a copy. Um, the first one is, that was like the point of the Orgum's plan. Like, Rom V isn't saying necessarily that history always repeats itself. He's saying that in this story of the Orgum's versus Gotham, they have used supernatural forces to make history repeat itself. And it was depending on your religious perspective, it could be chance, it could be providence, it could be grace of God, it could be the will of something. Bruce Wayne, on his travels through time, inserts himself into the Orgum's plan. If the Orgum's had not had a bat to oppose them, they would have taken over Gotham, and Gotham would have become like Chicago before Chicago in uh, Prohibition. You know, it would have been this town of absolute organized crime, but it would have become so much earlier, and there would have been no no spirit of integrity and honor and justice to oppose them. So, to me, it feels sort of like, you know, you, you have this plan that you know could just destroy the world, but then the one person, like the, the spark of a candle, sheds light on the darkness and, and drives it away for a time. Not forever, but it gives people a chance to you know, stand up for what's right. So I, that affected me. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, and that explains a little bit more about what the Orgums are all about. Yeah, they're clearly just trying to come and take over Gotham again. There are just more ways of doing it. I, I will also say, <laughs> because this run has been so difficult to understand for me, and maybe this is a me problem, um, I just appreciate the fact that I, I know what's going on. Like, But, okay, so here's another question, then. Why did they wait 300 years? That, again, I think that is something Ramvi needs to answer. I think he needs, maybe, um, you know, we'll see more flashbacks and like this Batman, this early Batman will deal them such a crippling economic blow that it took them a long time to rebuild to a point where they feel they could come in and take over again. God, I hope not. That's the kind of thing he needs to show us though. He can't just sort of like let I, us assume I, it. I don't know if I would like that. I oh, just, uh, 
I mean, but it would be an answer. Yeah, I'm. I'm, and again, it, it, and I just no, I wouldn't like that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Do you like the references to other literary works like Sleepy, Sleepy Hollow uh, with Ichabod Crane and The Crucible with uh, Joe Proctor? Well, I mean, doesn't Jonathan Crane always based on Ichabod in a way? Was he? I actually didn't know. Oh. But I feel like that parallels. And I don't know. As someone who who hasn't read either book in easily over a decade, I really don't care. Um, they kind of irritated me because I actually really dislike both of those works. <laughs> Um, and I didn't feel that they really added any texture. Like Joe Proctor was just such a cliche. Like burn the witch, burn. Like come on, that's not a character. That's a mindless straw man. And Ichabod Crane. Like why does he need to be named Ichabod? If you're going for Jonathan Crane's ancestor or something, like name him something like Nathaniel. You know, Ichabod doesn't work. That's just okay. So that's. A, Maybe it's minor. These aren't super big characters, but it just felt like that was a weakness in craftsmanship for me. Um, well, and um, side word. It felt like everyone else had um, the same initials, and so then Ichabod kind of threw that out. I actually didn't catch right away that he was fear until the later on. Yeah, I, I didn't like, oh, think right, it was. Crane, yeah. I didn't think it was necessarily super well signposted, if that makes sense. So this one really kind of weirded me out. Um, so Ayana is the poison ivy analog, and she's supposed to be an Ojibwa woman, uh, a Native American. And she looks like poison ivy, which means she has very pale skin and red hair. That just seems really weird to me. Did did that bother you guys at all? I didn't catch that. That's what she was supposed to be. And I thought she was fine. I thought she had red hair, but like whatever she was, she didn't have like she's raven blonde. dark she's hair. She's as blonde and white as a Norwegian. Um, a lot of things bother me. Why did Alfred look like Snape? You know, why did. Why was there a Two Faced character who. I don't know. It was all silly. It was all silly. Yep. Okay, I'm glad. I don't know. This one just really stuck out to me because I'm like, if she's supposed to be Native American, why does she look so white? So white. She was the whitest of all the people there. I, I don't know. That was weird. That I don't know who's responsible for that either. If that's a colorist or an artistic choice or if Ron V said she's got to look like Poison Ivy. I don't Somebody, it feels, really fell down on the job there. I, again, if this had been an Elseworlds story, I I would have been more into it, but the way it was executed I'm, two, is too in the face. I was not. Any, any other thoughts on this annual? I said the arts who did the story. Well, we did have three artists. We had the the current artist, uh, Raphael Albuquerque, doing the present day sequence. Christopher Mittens, who's working on Ram V with, uh, on other indie series, he did the flashbacks. And then there was a couple sequences that were by another artist. I couldn't quite figure out which ones those were. But um, actually, honestly, I like the Albuquerque stuff. I actually didn't like the past stuff. It felt really fuzzy, like he was drawing with literal mittens on his hands. There was no <laughs> sharp line work. There was no. It just felt. Wobbly. I liked, I liked it because it felt elseworldy, which is what I liked. I don't know. If I see who, who the third artist was, they're the ones doing the the, the montage of art because that looks completely different than everyone else's art. Sure. What about you, Theo? Nothing else there. All I, right. I really didn't care. All right. Let's give this a rating out of five reality engines. Oh gosh! Uh, and I have I have put down my 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 rating already, so no one can accuse me of choosing a rating for a mode. I'm gonna have to say two. 
I just am not loving this story. And this didn't do anything to help me understand in a satisfying way what was going on. I will also give it a two. I just, I just don't need any more elf world in my Batman continuity. I mean, it, you, there's, there's so many other ways this story could have been told from the aspect of what the Orgum's plan was and just, just, just didn't do it. I didn't, I didn't need a, I didn't need another interlude into the return of Bruce Wayne. <laughs> I will agree. I wasn't super into that part. Um, wait, sorry. What was your rating, Theo? Two. All right. Uh, I gave two, it a three. Two, uh, nope. Two, two, five. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you cheated. You cheated. Um, all right. So I give it a three. That gives us a complete round average of 2.5 and before Theo changed it we had a mode of 2 but then he changed it and we don't whether you are a first time TBU Comics podcast listener a 13 year veteran or anything in between we'd love to hear what you think about this episode or any of the comics we discussed send emails to tbu at thebatmanuniverse.net join our discord server linked at thebatmanuniverse.net send us a tweet at tbu underscore comics or if you're a patron leave us a comment on our patreon page we'd also love it if you left us a review on itunes We'd love to read your comments on the next episode of the Batman Universe Comics Podcast. Batman may claim he works alone, but we know that he needs the Bat Family. Join the TVU Bat Family and let us know what you think. Let's move on to our review of Batman number 100. Batman number 130, Story 1, Fell Safe, Part 6, written by Chip Spadowski, art by Jorge Menez, colors by Timu More. As the issue begins, Batman, who is floating in space after the explosion of the Watchtower base on the moon, resupplies his oxygen from a damaged Justice League ship, then hurdles toward the Earth. He uses his oxygen supply for jet propulsion, and once Batman enters the gravitational pull, he plummets fast. Batman's suit is heat resistant, but his oxygen mask isn't. He rips off his trunks and covers his mask to protect it. His suit lighting up as the hero descends towards the Earth's atmosphere. Batman crash lands near the Fortress of Solitude, which awakens Superman from his stasis. Robin, Tim Drake, tries to keep Superman from climbing out of his stasis pod, but it's no use. Once Batman enters the fortress, he asks for Superman's help as a diversion. Bell safe is coming. Superman dons a special suit and meets Bell safe out in the snow. The two battle, with Bell safe quickly pointing out Superman's weak points and using them against the Big Blue. Inside the fortress, Batman plans with Robin. On the moon, he used a new Genesis weapon to blow a hole in Failsafe's back. While Batman can't destroy the machine from the inside because of fail, because Failsafe is impervious, he can use nanotechnology to infect and slowly alter Failsafe's personality. Batman thinks back to his nightmare of Joker murdering Tim, then collects himself. Failsafe's d- Failsafe is designed to be as good as, if not better than Batman at everything, but Failsafe lacks the dynamic duo that is Batman and Robin. Outside, Failsafe has defeated Superman. Batman and Robin enter the fight, and Batman notes that Tim was the best at teamwork, at fighting in sync. When the opportunity arises, Batman infects Failsafe with the nanobots inserting compassion into the machine's programming. Failsafe then rushes to the Fortress of Solitude and picks up a weapon. Batman realizes that he fails, and soon Failsafe returns, blasting Batman to nothing. 
There's nothing but scorched earth in the snow of Batman's wake. And Robin falls to the ground, sobbing. Failsafe's mission is complete. And it ends, and it ends this program, flying off to the cold, gray, snowy sky. Did you predict this ending? No, I did not. Um, I did notice. So there's some things that you know, didn't say about the ending was that after Batman's dead, Failsafe's word bubbles change color and they're not red anymore. And so he's not angry anymore, question mark. He's, his programming has changed him. He's got a different objective. I don't know what the color change means. Gender change? I don't know. Um, um, but the last thing you see is Batman in Gotham. He's in some city on a cobble street somewhere um, on the ground, all bloody, but not dead. Or not too dead, maybe mostly dead. Uh, he's not evaporated. Um, so it's God. very, it's God. very reminiscent of Tim being transported. Um, at the end of, uh, whatever that was. His, yeah, yeah, yeah. His 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 glory days on deck, and then he was in a cage for like six months or whatever it was. But um, no, uh, no, I did not expect that. It was oh. Uh, it's very exciting. Didn't expect it. Don't know how I feel about it. And I probably won't until we get more of the story. I did not um, predict it at all. Um, I thought that this was going to be Batman persuading Failsafe to stop. Mm -hmm. And he obviously did not do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I saw someone on Twitter uh, a long time ago, like uh, two months ago, complaining, oh, man, everyone knows it's going to happen. It's so predictable. And I'm like, yeah, that's sort of what I'm predicting. And then it was, completely wasn't. So I'm like, <laughs> I feel vindicated against the cr the cranky Twitter person. like, <laughs> Chip Zdarsky fooled us all. I kind of feel whatever that weapon fail safe use was actually a teleport that Batman probably rigged. I exactly. think there's a good chance and, of that. I mean, Steph was and, talking about how this is exactly like what happened to Tim Drake in Detective Comics at the beginning of Rebirth. But the question is, like, what did it? Was he teleported at the last second? Like, ha what happened to Tim? Did, yeah, did, did... Because Failsafe's just picking up some weapon he found? Maybe it was a... <laughs> Maybe it's a... Oh, oh, gosh, what's that place? That Superman has a, a gun. Phantom play. Zone. <laughs> it's a Phantom Zone gun. <laughs> modified Phantom uh, Zone projector or something. I don't know. Let's let's get the elephant out of the room. A lot of people have been talking about this. What do we think about Batman falling from the moon? <laughs> okay, listen, friend. Okay, okay, listen. This is Engineer Steph. This is Engineer Steph who loves Apollo. Like, if there's a documentary on Apollo, I've probably seen it. Okay? So, so listen. Listen. Uh, there's a lot of things. There's so many things. But I'm going to focus on two. One, his little gas tank going 60 times is not going to get him up to 40,000 miles per hour. And even if, even if the was able to get him to Mach 9 for three seconds at a time, even if that was possible, which it's not, that still is not going to get him up to 40,000 miles per hour. I literally did the math last night. It's not, it's, you, you can't. And also that little is not going Mach 9. Two, okay. He is holding on to his spaceship with his finger. Okay? He's not being propelled. His space his little spaceship is. He's not being held on by gravity. There is no gravity. He's being held on by his finger touching the button. If he was going Mach 9 on his little spaceship with his finger holding onto the spaceship, he would slip right off and tumble through space and he'd be dead. There's just 
There's just no way. And there's so many other issues. I can't even get started with this. Okay. But the two big things are is he wouldn't be able to hold on to his little little right life raft, his his Jack Dawson life raft there. And and two, he wouldn't be able to get up to those speeds. And then three, okay, one more. He enters the world's atmosphere at a 90 degree angle. Straight down. He would be toast. He wouldn't even be toast. He would be ex Batman. He would be he would be vapor. He would be because you have to enter the Earth's atmosphere at a specific angle and also be a spaceship. You can't be a human being to enter the Earth's atmosphere. They call it they call it a window. They do. It is it is oh what is it? It's oh dang it. I don't remember the word. I'm bad at I'm bad at words. But it's it's yeah. There's like a little window of degrees that you can enter the atmosphere. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. Yeah. And no the grace type type. I do. I wish I was Neil the Grace Tyson. He's so smart. They would have a field day discussing the physics of this. <laughs> I mean, so 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 granted, so if if you're not following us on the server and you should, then I'll then I'll pitch. <laughs> I will say, if you do go to the server, you'll notice that I was wrong at first because I didn't catch from the last issue that he was on the moon. I oh, thought he was just yeah. in Earth orbit. And I was like, dude, Earth orbit is not 240,000. So that actually is an accurate number for where the moon is and how far Batman would have been, I guess. But, oh, and fourthly, <laughs> he'd oh, yeah. be a Batsicle. You can't survive 12 hours in space and not freeze to death. So fourth thing. I, I, I don't know if it- what, where did he get the wherewithal to build a suit thin enough, but <laughs> thin enough to show all of his uh, muscles? M- yeah, muscles and six packs and stuff. Yet keep him <laughs> keep him warm. Oh yeah, in the space. Well, okay, no. So who well, listen? Actually, okay, I gave him a pass on that one because I was like, okay, well, if this is the same spacesuit or the same bat suit that kept him warm in Siberia, I guess it can keep him warm in space. <laughs> Although the question of how this bat suit provides enough pressure that Batman doesn't die of the bends is another question. Uh, and well, how he's able to survive re-entering the Earth's atmosphere because his suit... <laughs> Oh but wait, how the hell is Batman smart enough to, to have a suit that will protect him, but dumb enough where the face mask will not? <laughs> uh, and he have to and he have to take off his drawers, which probably got a little bolly smell to it unless he uses one of those anti perspirant thingies. You know? Anti perspirant can withstand um, <laughs> space travel and all that. <laughs> Physics, y'all. Physics. Uh, but I love it. Was, see, see, I'm okay with ridiculous and stupid. As long as you tell a good story. I, mean, I think stuff, it's, stuff doesn't have to make sense in comics as long as it's a good story. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Batman is sane after 20 years of sleeping two hours a night. Mm-hmm, That's mm-hmm. just as unrealistic as Superman being able to fly, guys. Mm-hmm. Well, if I'm walking around on two hours of sleep, don't put me behind the wheel of a car. I know, right? Yeah, definitely don't put you behind the wheel of a car that goes like 200 <laughs> miles an hour like James Tynan did. Oh, um, yeah, that was bad. Oh, God. That was awesome. What are you talking about? <laughs> I got rid of all the safety features so I could go faster. <laughs> that was <laughs> so Somebody's dying. And I'm not necessarily talking about me. Oh, it's me. I can't breathe. Uh. <laughs> you can't breathe in space. <laughs> Uh, Apparently he can use an use an oxygen supply from a destroyed ship. Oh my gosh! <laughs> it, was a, I just can't get over the the trunks that that just did it for me. The trunks. Him wearing his trunks on his face. Oh, is that so what that was? Yeah. I thought he put his cape around his face. What is what is his trunks or what is it cape? No, no, the, the, the trunks makes more sense because, like, I don't see where the cape is coming from. So I think you're probably right. But then it becomes a question. If, if 
you take your trunks off and you got your suit under it. What's, what's the purpose of the trunks? Extra protection. You can't have babies now. <laughs> it was to hide the smell. Well, you know, Batman canonically has many future children, so obviously this is like lead-lined undies. <laughs> On the inside. Protect them from X-ray vision from Superman. No, you're totally right, right. because then they're gone later. Okay, no, no, you, you're totally 100% right. Okay. Ew! <laughs> <laughs> Put his underwear on his face, gross. <laughs> All right. Um, are we going to talk about what a cutie pie Tim is in this? He's such a cute baby angel. Yes, let's talk about Tim. What do you think of Tim? Do you think that this story, this six art, sorry, six issues, uses Tim as Tim, or is this just generic Robin? How do you feel about that? A little bit generic, but I feel like he's been the part, the the Robin, the the partner Robin that Batman has now. I don't know. Has he been super smart? He's not really. Been super and smart. and Zdowski tries to say it, you know, in in the writing by basically, you know, saying, "Hey, you know, you've always been the best at this and that." So he, it, it's it's really generic robin but you see he i will say this this is more tim drake than uh fifth martin's tim ah. drake <laughs> and i will say that without reading anything after issue one i do think that this does the relationship between batman and robin in this arc feels much more specific to Tim to me because Jason was so much more rebellious. Mm -hmm. I could see it being Dick, but this is clearly an older Batman like Dick and, 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 and Bruce would be very young Batman, you know? And, um, the way Zdarsky writes Dick in the, the backups here, it does feel different than his Tim. So I do think he's being intentional in the way he voices. And I don't mean this in a mean way at all. I feel like Tim is the most quote unquote generic, but I think that's just because he's so straight laced. So it's, it's, I would think what I'm saying is generic Robin. And I hope I'm not trying to be offensive. Generic Robin is Tim because the, like, I would say Dick is more like hyper and super friendly and excited and jumpy jumping beans. Right. Uh, Jason, like you said, is grumpy and snarky and a smart ass. Uh, Damien and Steph is, is a girl with big blonde hair. Steph is a big girl with, with a happy personality and big blonde hair. Uh, Damien is <laughs> the grumpy, <laughs> smart <laughs> aleck, um, wise ass, wants to be Batman someday. And then you have Tim, who is probably a lot like Bruce and, and a lot like Batman in his, like we say, the detective way. So he just ends up a lot of times he is smart and he is friendly and he is kind. And I feel like those are quote unquote generic Robin traits, but they're also uniquely Tim. So yes, I feel like maybe he's written a little generic, but I feel like the generic standard was set by Tim. Therefore it is Tim because he's not any of the others. I don't know. That may come off too offensive. And I'm sorry if you love Tim and that was offensive, but I didn't mean it in a mean way. I just meant it like, Tim is the quintessential Robin. Is that a better way of saying it? Tim had 183 yeah. issues as Robin. No one else has come close. So I, I totally get what you're saying, and I agree. I don't know if I'm going to agree. I, I guess, <laughs> well, I, well, he I was guess, a Damien guy. Well, not, not just that. You know, so again, this is the old guy of the group. The But you got to remember the concept of Robin, at least in its original iteration, was to somewhat be Batman's opposite. And that being the case, Dick fits that mold perfectly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tim, Tim, from a teammate standpoint, from a detective standpoint is most like Bruce and one would think would be 
the next person to be Batman if mm. if 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 that was if that day was to ever come, which it won't, but still. <laughs> um and you know, if replaced Batman could probably fool anyone into thinking he was Batman because of his demeanor, his detective skills, everything. Whereas Jason's an ass and Damien's an ass, who I love. But the quince the quintessential Robin, I from the original from the original iteration of the character, I can't I can't necessarily say that because the original was supposed to be Batman's opposite. The light to Batman dog. No, no, absolutely agree. I guess I'm just saying because Tim now has been Robin for so long, I feel like that's changed a bit. I totally agree and think that yes, he was supposed to be the opposite and that's how he started. But because Tim is so much like the detective, I feel like that's sort of become Robin. Is like he's Batman's opposite, but he's also the same on a lot of levels. Well, anyone who's trained by Batman for a long period of time is going to pick up a lot of those yeah. skills and mm-hmm. habits. Mm-hmm. I mean, even Jason in Red Hood and the Outlaws has a lot of detective skills. He doesn't always use them, but oh, yeah. sometimes yeah. he buckles down and uses them. And you're like, oh, well, he was Robin for like three years. Mm-hmm. Uh, they all have it. Tim, exactly. Tim, Tim's advantage over the rest of them is he had those skills before he became Robin. Because again, he deducted that he deduced that Bruce Wayne was Batman and leading up into Nightfall. So he he had skills coming into it already, you know, and and unlike the others, wanted to wanted the position, whereas everyone else kind of fell into it. I guess you know had had situations that led them to become the boy girl wonder um so there's that as well i feel like i answered this right i don't know Probably. i think i did we talk a lot um, well i mean this is the podcast if we don't talk what's the point but that's why we're here exactly what do you think is going to happen going forward <gasps> I don't even know, man. Oh, man. Ugh. So, obviously, Batman is not... I mean, no, I shouldn't say that. Obviously. A Batman appears to be in Gotham. Or at least some nasty dark C-I-L-B. New York, maybe. <laughs> He's gonna team up with... Never mind. Um, uh, I don't know. <gasps> okay. Just because I have no idea, I say he's he's been trans... Ported to um, what's it, Allie, where Catwoman lives, and she's going to take care of him. And this is where the crossover starts. Not Crime Alley. Where is she from? Alley Town. Alley Town. That is that is my heart's desire. As long as we don't get another Return of the Ruth Wayne story, I'm okay because that was very reminiscent. Yeah. Well, I have an idea that I think he was going to like just as well as Return of the Bruce Wayne. What if we get Super Heavy Part 2 with Amnesia oh, and Bruce no, Wayne? Oh. No, Amnesia, no. <laughs> I knew you guys were going to do that. Okay, so listen. All, all fate all faith in Chip Zdowski yes. would probably be lost if that was to happen. Okay, well, I was going to go slightly more positive. <laughs> Ten issues of Lumber Bruce. I was going to go a slightly different, more positive thing of what Theo just said, which is, Chip has yet to disappoint us. All of his, anything that he's done that has appeared to be a generic plot or a uh, trope has, has not been like it's, or if he's done something generic, it's been very interesting. So I have faith that even if by some lack of imagination, he did amnesia, it would at least be interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I'm not convinced. The thing is, like, the next... Maybe you want to cover your ears, because I'm going to talk about solicitations. Um, oh, no, fine. Um, 
it says that Batman does seem to be missing, but we also see Bruce hanging out. So part of me thinks maybe this blast, whatever it does, has affected his memory. Um, he could forget he's Batman. I'd be fine with that. Or maybe he's lost some mojo or something. Or maybe he's broken his back. Wouldn't that be original? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen that a billion times in Tom <laughs> King's run. But, um, oh, no. oh, oh. yeah, I mean, if there was something I'm, that took I'm him off the field for a while, that'd be fine as long as we had Bruce. I'm, I'm scored by Super Harry. So. <laughs> by what? Super Heavy. Oh, so I'm scored by. Uh, Everyone knows I really like Super Heavy. It's my favorite Snyder arc. <laughs> that 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 arc was six issues too long. <laughs> I actually completely agree with that. I just loved his Jim Gordon. Like Jim Gordon was the best. But yeah, it was way too long. Well, the thing is, <sighs> Rabbit Trail. I still think that Super Heavy would have been way better if he'd broken it up into three arcs. If he had three three issue arcs, each of them with a beginning, middle, end, and it's like this is Jim Bats fighting this villain, and then he finishes, and this is Jim Bats fighting this villain, and then you have Bruce Wayne in the background doing the things he does. But instead, it's just Bloom is such a terrible villain, and he's the villain for ten freaking issues. Like that's the real problem I think with Super Heavy is Bloom just sucks. Okay, <laughs> the end end my rabbit trail. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't I I I mean we already we already have a Bruce I mean what DC promised with these solicits and these interviews with Chip Fedowski is that we were gonna get something that we never seen before. If we get Bruce with amnesia not remembering who he is, uh that's kinda super heavy. Without gym bats. You mean the best part of super heavy? <laughs> Without and all the best part of super heavy. And and and, and, and <clears throat> Not to say I'm not, I wasn't a fan of Jim Bats. Again, it was okay. It was just too long. I was more a fan of Rookie without Jim Bats incorporating. Rookie was great. I was so happy when James Titan brought him back. Rookie was awesome, but we don't need Super Hit. We don't need a amnesiac, no memory Bruce Wayne. We just don't. I wonder if he just stays low so that what's his butt? Failsafe doesn't come back. And then at the end of the arc, we get another subconscious machine that will put his memories back in the crotches. And we still have a backup. You should definitely read Super Heavy. You get to see like so much hot Bruce. Like he's like super, super hot. And he has a girlfriend. A very tattooed girlfriend, and you see a lot of her tattoos. Don't read. Oh, Don't I got, read. I got others. It. It, 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 it was another one of those stories where you get pissed off at the end because there was no reason for them to break up him and Julie just the same way. There was no reason to break up Dick and B. Other than there, the fact there was that, indeed a reason to break them up other, because other than, other Scott than the fact Snyder they, doesn't think Batman can be happy. Can be happy, yeah. Other than the fact that they can't be happy, they have to be miserable to do their job, which is nonsense. All right. <laughs> Any pieces of art that really stick out to you? I mean, this is Jorge's last issue for an arc, but then he'll be back. So let's savor a piece of Jorge art before uh, he leaves for a bit. Um. I like Batman um, just after the explosion and you see the moon in the back or the earth in the background. That was pretty cool because I like space. That was kind of cool. I mean, stupid, but cool. <laughs> and then I really love Tim. The way he draws Tim. He's just such a cutie patootie. I love it. Like the scene where um, Tim says, but if he keeps coming, we're thousands of miles from home, from help. He just let him back to me. He does a good job. I mean, Jorge is Jorge, so what, what, what's not to like? Mm-hmm. I, I really love the, the scene of Bruce falling to Earth. That's just beautifully composed, beautifully colored by Tumu More. Uh, it's just the kind of thing that... Jorge's talked about how he, like spends a little extra time on things that he thinks are going to be like the, the money shots of the, the comic. And I think that's um, I think this is definitely one of those moments when he's falling to Earth. Um, Even just, if it's Batman. It's Batman. 
Um, all right. Last question. Do you think this arc, these six issues, stand by themselves? Could you hand someone and say, this is Batman fail safe, and you think they'd be... Like, do you think that'll be a standalone, or do you think no? No, you have to know what happens next. It, Batman's dead. What's going to happen next? I wouldn't. I would not be satisfied if he handed me this and then didn't hand me the sequel or hand me the next Agreed. one. Agreed. It's the I think so too. Of- I think. Story. And and the thing is, when I think back over the last several major runs. Um, okay, so obviously Williamson basically just did two arcs. Um, so I'm, I'm not even going to really call Williamson's a run per se. It was a filler arc. Um, and I, I feel bad because I, I like Williamson, but it was a filler arc. D- does anyone disagree with me? Which one was that again? It was uh, uh, Abyss. Oh. Abyss. Cool. It was a it, filler arc. It was, a, it was something. It was, something. <laughs> it was a bad filler arc. Um, Tynan, his first arc was their dark designs, and that clearly just led straight into Joker War. So that's another instance. First arc goes into the next thing. Uh, Tom King's first arc was I Am Gotham, and that, I think, clearly ends with just so many loose threads. Like, Tom King is just starting to build out his story, so that doesn't stand by itself at all. And uh, Court of Owls. Now, a lot of people love Court of Owls. I actually really dislike the ending of Court of Owls because I don't think it ends. Like, there's just so many questions and it's really frustrating and I don't like and when I say Court of Owls, I mean the first, uh, like, 12 issues. Uh, The whole Court of Owls, Night of the Owls thing. I don't think that ends well at all. Um, Again, I... And it's and it's so weird because like everyone's like Court of Owls is so good and like everyone sells that story and that story. I think that's really because of the style of it. I think that the combination of Capullo arc uh, and the whole creepiness of the owls. I think that's why people like it. I don't. I don't think that the end of that story is good at all, and I don't think it's satisfying on its own. In conclusion, there is no. I'm trying to remember Morrison's thing because Morrison was the one before Snyder. Uh... So I think that's why Hush. One of the reasons Hush is so popular is that it's twelve issues, it's, beginning, middle, it's end, completely standalone. Yeah. yeah, and it's easy to market. Same yeah. thing with Year One, Long Halloween. Oh, like yeah. the things people always remember are these easily marketable things. And part of me thinks, I mean, okay, so we want long runs, right? I think all of us agree. Like we want, we want. Because we like the consistency, we like the to really getting to know what a writer thinks about Batman and the supporting cast. We love those relationships that develop. And you know, if you're switching writers all the time, those relationships are going to go nowhere because someone's going to come in and reset the relationship, or have a completely different take on the character, or have a brand new love interest. Hello. <laughs> I but, will only add the caveat that I long, long runs only if they are close together. Again, super heavy was just. Too long. Well, no, no, no. Silver Heavy is an arc in the longer Snyder run. Like, we can talk about the, the structure of arcs within runs, but like... But like, but like Shadows, that was a... I need... For something that long, I need... I need it more consistent. I need a weekly book. <laughs> or two, uh, or twice monthly. But Chad is a good example of something that was decently self. It was long, but I mean, it's self-contained. Beginning, middle, end. It was, yeah. yeah, beginning, middle, end. That's the big thing. Like, it has an ending. Like, the, the thing that we don't like about a lot of... Uh, the thing that sort of sets arcs apart is... Do you feel that... That oomph when it's over? Like, for example, Batman the Night. I think that is a great standalone. I would hand that to someone in a heartbeat. Because it's got beginning, middle, end, uh, really gets to know those characters really well done. You know what I'm saying? But it also opens the door for what's next, but without being a cliffhanger. Right, yeah. exactly. Like, that's a really hard balance. And the thing is, we know Zdarsky wants to do several years. And so, when you do several years, do you want to start off your arc with something where the editors can say, oh, well, we don't really like you, and you just ended your arc, and, and there's no real uh... things going forward, so we're firing you. <laughs> like, you want to like be like, no, this is my big statement. I got so much stuff to do. I'm not going to wrap it up. So you can't fire me. But like, Ugh. what does that do to your legacy? What do we do yeah. in like four years when you look at, you know, I am Gotham or 
obviously Cordoval is just sold like hotcakes and they still sell that stupid story all over the place. Now, all this being said, I would still hand someone this Fallout story and I would want them to say, give me the next one because it's really good. Whereas like some stories that we're talking about, I wouldn't want anyone to hand that to me. I'm okay not reading it. Whereas like with Tom King, yes, he went on and on and on and on. Some people argue that it, at one point it started to suck. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And that he was rushed at the end and that's not his fault. Um, That's fine. Good. I like it. I, I collected the whole thing. And it's very long. It takes a lot of space on my shelf. <laughs> that's fine with me. personally. Yeah. I think these are all really good thoughts, and I, I'm just excited that we're getting to sink our teeth into the beginning of a new run, um, and a run that we know is intended to last longer than the, the Williamson run. Well, not a new run, but a new arc. No, no, just, uh, this is the Zadarsky run. I'm thinking of since June, we've been sinking our teeth into this whole oh. run. Oh, I thought you were talking about going on from the end of this arc into the next one. I, I mean, this is Second to last ish episode of the year. I'm sort of thinking sort of retroactively, retrospectively. All right. Uh, yeah, and I'd agree with you guys. I don't think this stands by itself, but I, I, that's kind of what I wanted to think about with you guys, because I feel like the first arc in a run, in a run that we know is planned to be bigger, I feel like you kind of do need to be like, boom, what next? Um, so I'm not mad. I'm. I'm super not mad. I'm very excited about what's happening next. But I also am like, but if it ended here and Zdarsky like got hit by a bus, I would be really upset. Oh my god, um, that's kind of what happened to Ruby. <laughs> uh, Ruby started this really oh yeah, the dude died. Awesome story. Then he went into the doctor, didn't realize he was allergic to penicillin, died, and the storytelling and like the storyline just I don't know. I haven't watched it in years. Apparently, got really depressing and just all over the place. But yeah. That totally can happen. R.I.P. Montiome. But. Uh. All right. Uh, let's go into our backup after. <laughs> wow, that was a significant discussion of the first. <laughs> but I mean, it's the end of our. I feel like we should take the time to think about what's going on. Theo, can you read us a summary for backup? Story number two. I Am A Gun, Part 3, written by Chip Zdarsky, with art by Leonardo Romero, and colors by Jody Belair. Batman sees Batman of the Renard wailing on the Joker while the real Batman sits in his mental prison. Bruce Wayne didn't intend for the Renard to assume control, to take the reins and rid the clown prince of crime once and for all. Inside his mind, Bruce argues with this killer Batman. Zorner argues that killing rogues save lives, but Bruce then envisions a version of the Joker trapped inside the mind of the garish exterior. There's a broken personality in there, one who has lost control and is asking to be saved. Bruce then sees his mother, and she tells him that he's not a killer and that Zorner is nothing but a hollow anchor. Bruce assumes control once again and saves the Joker. He returns to the Batcave and finishes the Zora Protocol, reminding himself that he's the most dangerous man alive and can't succumb to the darkness. It scares Batman, and as a reminder, perhaps, he adopts the gold emblem on his chest before going out on patrol with Robin. How do you feel about this expansion of the R.I.P. Zurinar concept? Well, I mean, again, I didn't read R.I.P. Um, but it's yeah. If you're gonna ask questions, then you need to ask questions that everybody can relate to. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. What? <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I don't understand. I your question with your, your question refers back to Batman R.I.P. And Steph never read I it. Never so read it. No, no, it's all right. But, um, it is not my fault. I told I've been asking about RIP for that, three for episodes. Sure. No, no, I I pulled it up at one point to read it and then forgot. But um, I like that Batman explores himself. I like that he has a concept and he's willing to admit when it didn't work out. Um, I love it when Batman isn't too proud to admit he's wrong, even if it's just to himself. Um, and that he's taken from Zornar or something. Um, 
but also realizes that he needs to have compassion. He needs to not just be Zoranar. I don't know. I liked it. I thought it was a good character exploration. Overall, it was good <laughs> exploration. I don't know. I don't know if I feel the same about this issue on its own, however. I'm going to see if I can really put it into words. As far as what kind of turned me away from this story. And it really, I don't know. I'm trying to find the right words. Ian, go ahead while I'm trying to concept this. Sure, sure. Um, as I think a lot of people probably know at this point, if you've been listening, I am not a fan of Grant Morrison's run on Batman. And R.I.P. really is a big part of that. I do not enjoy that. I don't like the concept. I don't think it makes sense. And I think that the way they use Zer and R, while an interesting idea, I get much more out of like the summary of the issue. <laughs> because then I can imagine how it works instead of the way Morrison writes it. Because Morrison just presents Zer and R as just like, oh yes, back a person. I'm like, that is not a thing. How do you create a back... But Zdarsky actually takes you through the process of how Bruce created that backup personality and what it was like and what the dangers were. Like, this is the kind of story. And I I understand. Like, Morrison was trying to write a story that's like 60s Batman, zip guns and and spaceships and bubble helmets and crazy, crazy stuff happening with no explanation because that's cool and little kids like it. The problem is Morrison also wrote a ton of super dark and gross and nasty stuff that means that the kinds of readers that would really enjoy that kind of no-context goofiness are going to be way too young for it to be appropriate for them. So if you're going to do this kind of wacky concept, I think you need to dig into it to give it a bit more, not, not realism, but verisimilitude. Our ability to believe it and like feel the feelings, even though these characters are going through impossible situations. And so I like how Zdarsky did that. I felt what Batman was going through in this. I felt nothing in Batman R.I.P. <laughs> and I know this is like not a good advertisement for Steph to read R.I.P. And I'm not really saying she should, but I just do not like R.I.P. <laughs> and right. I really like this. Are you ready to go, Theo? Why do you keep bringing it up if you don't like it? Because it's like a, a splinter in my hand. Like, I, I view Batman, like, I, I know lots about Batman, and this thing sticks in my head because it still doesn't make sense. I haven't been able to figure out how to make it make sense. And maybe this story will help me to finally do that. So, what I've been thinking with regards to the, in regards to the whole origin story, is that it's been okay. Okay, so the overall the overall thing has been fine. And and I think what really turned me off to this particular story is what Zornar and his and Bruce's creation and ultimate control to put him back into the box or to put him into the box. I think my true issue with this story, and so and, it, and this probably doesn't answer answer Ian's question at all. Um, was the concept of who the Joker is, and that basically the Joker is Zornar full time. That inside the Joker psyche, that perhaps is a a more passive person. And maybe, and so again, like I say, I, th I don't think it really answers Ian's question. And I'm sorry if it doesn't. I mean, I'm basically just asking how you feel about the arc, and I think you've given a good articulation of that. Would you say this, this backup ended satisfyingly? Um, yeah. Because again, this is, it's a little history 
that didn't exist. It's a retcon history. Um, didn't really have the beginning, middle, end. I guess it did. It kind of came full circle. Came full circle. Y- yeah, I mean, for I mean, for a backup that was just supposed to explain a character that had only ever been explained via a few lines of text, I think that it did what it set out to do. Um, again, outside of the treatment of Joker, it ended okay. I would say yes. Um, this is explicitly a prequel to both Failsafe and R.I.P. So I wasn't expecting it to be like a super fully satisfying story because it's supposed to be a missing piece in these other stories. But I thought for what it is, it really was satisfying. I, as I said, I felt what Bruce was feeling, and that's what I, what I asked for from a Batman story. Let's give Batman 130 a rating out of five atmospheric re-entries. <laughs> um, mm, you know, I'm gonna... Ooh, mm, mm, you know, it has the quote-unquote death of Batman. It has fantastic art. I'm gonna say four. I'm feeling generous. I'm gonna say four out of five because three seven five seems too low. Four. If we're talking main story only, I would say a four. Um, with my dislike of the last issue of the backup, I will say a three. Oh, a whole point. Oh, sh- shoot. And I just so, Scott gave him. <laughs> go higher. You get at the whole. point. Point for the back? Okay, thank you, Steph. Three, two, five. (laughs) You guys are killing me. (laughs) I gave it a 3.5. I think this is above average ending to the arc. Um, It's hard for me to say, uh, just because I know this is the end of an arc, but it's the beginning of the run. And so... I'm really enjoying it. It's above average, but it hasn't quite hit those hit me in the hit me in the heart the way a run will tend to do later on when I've really developed an attachment for what the writer's doing. But I tell so, you what, I gave it a high because I spent a lot of time thinking about this issue and I busted out the calculator and I wrote notes and I looked up science facts and I discussed it with my husband and it was a lot of fun arguing with the episode or the issue. You went full Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> oh, so much fun. On the website, Scott gave it a three, which means that we again have no mode because <laughs> Steph and Theo live to crush my dreams. Our average is three point four four. Well, see, you can take you can blame Steph this time because she <laughs> talked me out of it. I know that's why I said Steph and Theo live to crush my dreams. Um. All right. That was the first time we've done two in a long time. I know, and <laughs> we're at an hour and a half, almost. <laughs> almost. Um, and we still got Greater Gotham to go. Greater Gotham. Greater Gotham's not too long, though. All right, Greater Gotham. Nightwing 2022 annual. Thumb up. Um, yeah, started really. I liked the parallel start. Um, really creepy, but the whole, I liked I liked the issue. All oh, right, it was it was a little anthology. It was neat. yeah, it was good. I liked it. Thumbs up for me, simply on the bite wing story. Yeah. Bite wing alone. Oh, oh man! Batgirl's twenty twenty two annual. Wait, wait, you could at least read the bite wing story. That was so- <laughs> But I didn't. Oh, that's right. That's, oh, yeah. <laughs> that was that was a cute one. Also, reason number 576 why I don't have a dog. <laughs> Batgirls annual 2022. Um, thumbs up. And it wasn't an annual. It was the arc next one of the arc. It was it was an episode. It was an issue from the arc. Yeah. <laughs> I have actually read several, several um, annuals that are like this. It's not quite as common. Um, but I've seen several of them that do this. Yes, but some people skip the annual. Which is really dumb. I don't I don't understand how annuals work. I feel like if I subscribe to series, I also want the annual. But apparently people don't think that way. 
I think it's the price difference. I think people are like, oh, I don't want to pay that much. But, like, I don't know. I have a job. Um, Theo, are you abstaining, oh. as I expect? Actually read the annual, mm-hmm. simply because uh-huh. I knew it was the Switch issue, and I will give it a neutral. Mm-hmm. Well, that's better. <laughs> I'm giving it a thumbs up. I don't actually like the art that much, but it is a thumbs up because I think that the writing team really has been improving, and I think this continues that. I agree. I'm much less irritated than I used to be, and I, I enjoyed the end. Uh, there's a really cool Batman. Like Bruce and oh, Bab yeah. have like a really good Thank mentoring you. moment together. And he's so um, chill. Even in the next issue, he's just so yeah. chill. <laughs> I love it. Grifter got run over by a reindeer holiday anthology. I only read the Batman story and it gets two thumbs up and two big toes and all my happy smiles. The short story is a Batman Catwoman story for those of you who haven't deduced this from (laughs) Steph's endorsement. (laughs) My God, she's so giddy. It's like a sequel to that short story date night. It's really good. I'm staying. I can't. I can't pick up anything, Grifter. I'll I'll send it to you. Just the just the back cast story. I um I read about half of this. Um, I would say that the Batman Catwoman story is a is a thumbs up. It's well crafted, very romantic and funny, and good art too. Uh, I like the Hawkman story. Um, the rest of the issue really gets a thumbs down for me. Uh, as a whole, is ten dollar anthology. Um, each story is only about eight to ten pages, so you're willing to pay 8 to 10 pages for a 10 page story and I will say I have paid $10 for one story in an anthology before so I'm not going to criticize if you do but if you do that be warned this is my opinion it is a thumbs down overall even though the story is a thumbs up so are the digital versions always the same price as the paper versions uh yes ah. Ah. however ah. I would recommend if you are interested in digital I would recommend looking at the DC Universe um, subscription service. Uh, the regular one, you get issues six months after the Ultra tier, which is currently, I think it's still $100. It might go up to $120 per year. You get them one month after release. So it's actually really, really quick. If you are interested in reading digitally, that is the way to go. Not really buying individual issues. Poison Ivy number seven. Uh, neutral. If this is a redemption arc, it's really slow and kind of weird. But what if it's not a redemption arc? What if it's actually what Ian wants and she's an evil villain again? Then it's really long. <laughs> <laughs> it's a neutral for me as well. Oh, it's still good, though. Oh, Creepy. except for the last, the last page where she's her, where she got the power taken away and so the spores are taking over her body and so she's all mushroomy at the end. Of- uh, I'm staying. I still am not reading Poison Ivy. Batman and the Joker, the deadly duo number two. Abstain. Neutral. Also abstain. Any Dark no- Crisis. Wait, hold on. Any, any notes for us, Ian, or Theo? <laughs> so it's still somewhat on this Europa trend um i i i don't know where silvestri is going with it though with all of the i'm just gonna call them zombie jokers Uh. and you got pieces of jim gordon popping up all over the place pieces of jim gordon Uh. i think it was um I can't remember. I think it was dumb. Ah! Ah! Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm They're... good. I'm good with the skipping. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was considering maybe picking it up, but no, thank you. I'm good. Yeah, so they're, they're trying to figure out who trailies. I'll just call them again, the zombie Joker. And the only way that Joker will tell Batman where Jim Gordon is is if he helps him. And if he takes too long, then Jim will die, because they're going to be cutting up little bitty pieces of him. Uh, 
every time. Yeah, yeah. Dark Crisis. Uh, Dark Crisis War Zone. Up and I skimmed through it and didn't find anything I felt like reading. Upstate. I really love this issue. Thumbs up. Um, and I say this because I actually have been reading Dark Crisis because I'm a traitor, as uh, <laughs> Theo says. Uh, but also because this starts with the Flash story, and uh, Flash is my favorite title currently. I just love the Flash right now. Um, and the Red Canary spoiler story at the end is really cool. With Dinah Black Canary mentors both uh, Stephanie and the new Red Canary. I thought that was a cool, very cool story. Have Gotham's they ever revealed who uh, Red Canary is yes, yet? So they revealed that she's a college student who is inspired by Black Canary in concert. They haven't given us her name yet. Gotham City, year one, number three. Bam, up, I like it. Upstain. Um, this issue is a neutral for me. Uh, first issue, I think, was either neutral or thumbs down. Second issue is a thumbs up. This isn't a neutral. It's very uneven. Um, and part of that's just because I know from the beginning, this is going to this, this story is just going to be unrelentingly tragic. <laughs> and so I just I don't know. I've. Oh, yeah. And yeah. This issue was definitely that yep, way. Yeah. This was a really sad issue. Although. So the scenes where I assume. Sam is beating the crap out of some, someone. I was confused when that took place and who he was beating up. That was like 10 years ago when he was still on the police force oh, and it like, caused okay. him to leave the police force. Okay, okay, okay. Right. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. Sword of Azrael, number five. Okay. You know you're the only person reading yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. This book is so good. <laughs> Thumbs up. You guys should check it out. Oh, man. Uh, oh. Did, did he break got, Batman's back in it? It's got fourth it's got fourth world stuff in it. It's got vengeance, daughter of Bane in it. It's got real whacked out cult stuff in it. It's got Azrael trying to be a good person. Like it's great. That. And the is art the, is amazing. Still, is vengeance still as hot as she was in Joker? Oh yeah. I don't, I don't hate she his butt. the main guy. What's his name? What's Azrael's name? Jean-Paul. Jean-Paul. I like Jean-Paul. I just don't like the Azrael. Well, this this really digs into that, okay. um, uh, and also it has the biblically accurate seraphim <laughs> with all the wings and eyes, which I loved. <laughs> Call them what reason of the reason. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. What is, uh, I, don't, I don't know what you guys are smoking. This is a great series. Batman Spawn. This is one shot, even though it ends on a cliffhanger. <laughs> so I tried. I like Capullo's arts, and, and and I guess I'd never read anything. Tard McFarlane's ever re- re- written? Has he, re- has he written anything before? Oh, no, I mean, he's written Spawn for the last 20 years. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. But, um... But he was primarily known as an artist on Spider-Man in the 80s and 90s. But, um... Did some Batman, too. Did it? You know, when it got to... Oh, yeah. When it got to Joker taking off his face again, and then there was oh, the little gosh. weird goblin guys, I was like, I'm good. Thank you. Close. I'm done. And you had to remind us of the absolute dumbest parts of the New Fifty Two. Yeah, I, I, no, I'm I, I'm abstaining as well. I hadn't read it yet, but yeah, he he, I, if I can remember, he drew all of, um, was it year two? Oh, maybe I think you might be right. Yeah, I know. I know he did. The I think cover. he did one of those years. Yeah, cover. but I think he, but I think he drew all of year two. Maybe that explains why I like you too. <laughs> but remember um, that, that, that wonderful cover that's now iconic is the statue at the uh, San Diego Comic Con Museum. That's tribute, and I have the statue from Batman Black and White. Yeah, but he, he, he he's done Batman as well. Uh, so apparently, I'm the only one who read it all the way through. Uh, this is. Honestly, it's kind of a thumbs down because it doesn't have an ending. They haven't promised to follow up with it. Greg Capullo just said he's Marvel exclusive. It's just like, I don't even know what they're doing with this book. He's, wait, he's strictly Marvel exclusive? I could be wrong. He's doing Marvel stuff. He might not be exclusive. I saw the story he was doing Marvel stuff. I didn't know if he was exclusive or not. I might be wrong there. I know he's doing Marvel stuff, but he's definitely not DC exclusive. Batgirls number 13. Thumbs up. It was very interesting. And the art was very retro. I There's like a brand that. new artist. Really cool stuff. Yeah, like I said, I read the annual <laughs> just because I am 
Ah. The editor's notes annoy the crap out of me, or rather the little narration things, but overall I, I enjoyed the the characters writing. Yeah. Thumbs up. Um as we said, for those who <laughs> I just think that the way they did this was not wise. I like it, but I don't think it was wise from a business perspective because, as I said, people don't pick up the annual. But this follows immediately from the annual. Um, it's all one story. Uh, thumbs up. I am Batman number 16. <laughs> you know, I wrote down neutral. I think I was feeling no, nice. This is not neutral. This is thumbs down. I have never used Ian used language to describe this book that he used in the survey. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I was very upset. You were very upset. I knew you'd be upset. So, full disclosure. Theo only read the last page. <laughs> <laughs> and based on the last page on its own, this is double thumbs, double toes, everything. Down, I, I'm. I'll. I'll go on in me, me, mini rant. This is crap. This is total <laughs> crap. This is. <laughs> this is as stereotypical as you can get, and I absolutely. I don't want to use the word hate. I absolutely dislike what John Ridley did here, and that's just. It's, it's bull. Bleep me out, Steph, but I, I, just stupid. If there was anything that would make me never want to pick up another issue of a John Ridley book, it would be this. It's just stupid. And it's hard to say that they'll explain it away because sometimes you end on a shocker and then it's like, oh, that's not what I meant or so, you know, whatever. This is kind of pretty straightforward. It's like, she just said she's not your mother. What else can that be? <laughs> yep. This is... <sighs> you may bleep me out if you please, but uh, I, will, I will say what I said on the server. This issue sucked balls. <laughs> I hated what happened in this issue. And it wasn't just the ending, which I thought was... I had the exact same thought as Theo. It was very stereotypical. We're supposed... <laughs> I love Lucius Fox. I've loved Lucius Fox since I saw Batman Begins. Batman Begins was one of the movies that got me into comics. I thought Lucius was awesome. He was smart. He was funny. He was he had integrity. Um, and I've loved reading about him in the comics because he's had these struggles. Like back in the seventies, he did have this struggle with Tim, who is now Jace. Um, and then and he's in the fucking Rolling Stone. What? Hmm? I'm sorry. That was going to be believed a lot. <laughs> um I Ridley has given me exactly zero reasons to like Lucius Fox in this entire story he's been telling and dozens and dozens of reasons for me to dislike him. He's lost his integrity, he's lost his intelligence, he's lost his agency, he's lost his bodily integrity, he's lost his compassion, he's lost any moral sense that I liked about the character before. And here's the thing. I'm okay with liking Lucius in the future because other writers will do other things. You know? But Ridley's Lucius Fox is contemptible. I do not like the character as Ridley writes him. And I think most, that is... Most, and most of the Fox family I could smack a few times. Really? Yeah. yeah. He, I mean, he has I, done it's, it's a number on all of them. The... the, the, the <laughs> And I love the Fox family, like except it's, for Tiffany, she's not my favorite. But you don't like I Tim. love Luke. You don't like Tiff. I like no, Tim. I I've had problems with Tiff since Future's End. I think Tiff is the best part of I Am Batman. That says a lot, simply because of what he's done with the family. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, he, he, Tam he, Tam should be like. After what they did with Tam and Red Robin, she was like a top tier character, but she's like a damsel in distress this entire stupid series. 
in and out of comas. I mean, she's oh been my gosh, coma. I'm so angry about that. I, 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 I don't know what Ridley's end game here. And again, this is someone. Well, he's only got two more issues. So who, who, this is someone who's enjoy who enjoyed Future State, you know, and what he did there. But since then. He's totally crapped it out. I, I, I don't know if it's because they... Well, and we liked Second Son, too. And it, I don't know if it's because they changed the direction of the universe post video and they weren't doing 5G and blah, 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 blah. I would but be interested to know who pitched the New York thing. This, this crap here is just... I am I am awaiting the day Bruce Wayne gets his money back. Just to <laughs> see the Fox family fail because of how uh, I, I just I mean everybody I mean all of the adults are bitches. I mean it, it really is. You, these are people you really can't stand. And like Ian said, you know, considering who Considering Lucius's demeanor throughout his history, whether you're looking at movies or comics, he's made him into, I mean, almost like a Ebenezer Scrooge. He doesn't care what happens. He's going to do all these shysty things. Like a succession, you know? I just... Or empire. Like, just nasty, super powerful, gross people. I'm just like, that's not Lucius. And... And like I said, this that last page, and it, I would have a hard time holding a decent conversation about that page with John Ridley. I don't know what what it is that he could tell me that would make me more accepting to how that to, to how that issue ended. It's just I don't know. It's it's the it's the type of stereotype that black people, and again, let me get on my deals, the black guy of the group, Bach. This is the type of crap that black people have fought against for ages and generations. And he just puts it front and center. That, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're a bastard. How you, how you like that, Luke? How you like that, Luke? You got your dad's name now, but uh, I ain't your mama. Yes, so it's just unpleasant yeah. and for no good reason, like zero, zero. There, there's not, there's nothing that, there's no way this story can end it that would make me accept what happened in this issue. Zero. Yeah, yeah. This might be the worst issue of the year for me of all books I've read, and you know this, and and, and again, I, I've, I've. Talked about, you know, some issues I've had with Blue Wall while still enjoying it. This <clears throat> terrible, absolute terrible. All right, um, Dark Crisis, Big Bang, number one. I think I'm the only one that read this. Yeah, I same here. Uh, this was a thumbs down. This was terrible. <laughs> Unlike the War Zone, which is a fun anthology, this was like one really long, really boring story with terrible characterization and not great art. Uh, not like terrible art, but it's just Damien looks 18 and it's just weird. Uh, and we'll end with Batman Incorporated number three. Thumb up. I very much enjoyed it. I was a little dubious of the. <laughs> Ghostmaker Robin character, but it was interesting enough. Um, and Bao is in a fight for his loyalty now. What is he going to do? Uh, and Bao now in this in this because he looks older than from Tynan's run. It was fourteen or fifteen in Tynan's run. Probably been a little bit. You feel like he'd be sixteen, seventeen now. But this thumbs up for me too. I, I I enjoyed it. Thumbs up for sure. I really like this delving into Ghostmaker's past, and I liked all the little bits of the other Batman Inc. members. Like even though they're only on for a page or two, um, Ed Brisson gives them some some personality and character. Like there's 
there's some richness in the writing here. And John Timms continues to do a really solid job, like really clear lines, which is what I was worried about. So Batman Inc. continues to be a solid thumbs up for me. Good I, title. I will say one weakness, and this is this is almost true for any book um, in DC. I really wish they'd have like little character titles if I haven't seen them in a while. Like one thing that My Hero Academia does is that pretty much any time there's a character who isn't a series regular, they get a little title image because there's just so many heroes in that stupid show <laughs> that you don't remember who anybody is. And so the little, it just really helps identifying who's who's what and all that. And so it's just, I, I would think that's a little helpful because there's so many Batman Inc. characters, never mind like on the team versus in the book uh, it's just it would be nice if maybe there was a little oh by the way this this person and this person it's just i don't know i would think that's helpful as someone who has zero memory and can't remember what i did last week that would be helpful i just wish it was called something other than batman ink because it clearly is not ghostmaker ink <laughs> ghostmaker ink i mean the thing is all all of pretty much all of the characters except for ghostmaker are from batman ink so, and yet there's no Batman. Batman and Batman is and, and, like and, dead, or like, in volumes one and two, you either had Bruce Wayne or Batman, and sometimes Robin in every single issue. Yeah, but volume two sucked, so I don't care. How many? How many issues have he showed up in this? Zero. Yes, exactly. All right. So that brings us to the end of Greater Gotham. We do have one piece of listener feud feedback from YouTube. We do on YouTube. T.Y., which is kind of funny, uh, said, I wish Zdarsky's run was post-Dark Crisis, but issue 128 had an editor's note stating that this was before Dark Crisis. Not too surprising, given Green Arrow and the Justice <gasps> What does that mean? What does that have to do? What? I'm not paying attention to Dark Crisis. Tell me about it. Uh, I mean, you know, Dark Crisis is they killed all the Justice yeah, League, and then Justice, yeah. But what's what's Green Arrow and Justice League specifically? Oh, um, actually, I don't. Hmm. Oh, T Y, you're going to have to very... give us more information. What do you mean by that? Yeah, the Green Arrow Dark Crisis one was very confusing, so I'm not 100 percent sure. Yes, tell us what you mean. I did read that, but it was like multiple alternate universes, so I got confused. And do we know what the end result is of Dark Crisis? Because if they're not, no, all, they yeah. keep coming out with another one. They all, they all just came back. They all just came back. Okay, that's funny. Yeah, I mean, did they, <laughs> everyone was like, "Oh yeah, the Justice League's dead." They're gonna. I was like, "No, they're gonna be back in under a year." Yep, did, they are. Wait, they weren't dead after the end of the issue, or at, the, at the, by the end of the second issue. No, it like the death of Justice League. They were dead at, at what, what was that? Justice League seventy five, and then oh, they're not dead. They're technically uh, feeding uh, Pariah's machine. Blah 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 blah. So dead it's my crisis. You expect this kind of goofy nonsense? Yeah, stupid. And 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 so since since we're talking dark crisis, oh gosh, just, are we? Just <laughs> end it. you started. I did you, not. I only read Dark Crisis for staff. You broke the promise. I there. did. But for staff. It's not Steph Mounds. I was going to say, don't blame this on me, but I know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, Stephanie <laughs> Brown, the spoiler. <laughs> I know. But uh, at some point, an event has to end. It just has to. I'm tired of events. I don't need any more crossovers. I don't need any more alphas and omegas and gammas and epsilons and delta either. Just give us our comics back. And, 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 and I say this not only to DC, I say it to Marvel too, because Judgment Day and now Web of Darkness and I'm just tired. We don't need all these events. Just give people their comics. Because we're not buying crossovers. We're not buying all this stuff anymore. To just give us our comics. I don't know what 
is going on in dark crisis and it's going to absolutely ruin what's going to happen in the future with the books that I am reading simply because I'm not reading dark crisis and don't want to read dark crisis. I have no intentions on reading dark crisis. Just stop it with the events. We don't need them. We don't need them. You can't correct what you've done to continuity. You can't. You tried. You tried it with all these other crises beforehand and they failed. And you're failing with this one too. I just, I don't get it. We don't need them. Sorry. Not sorry. We don't need them. All right. <laughs> Boy, I got y'all quiet. I mean, I don't, I'm not an event fan either. I just have kind of given up on ranting about it at this point. Says the person who's read every issue of Dark Christ. <laughs> yeah, but I don't. I'm not paying anything extra for this. It's on DC Universe. It's on DC Universe already? Well, I have Ultra, so I have everything up to a month ago. Gotcha. I missed out on the, on the special for uh, existing, existing users. Oh, man. If they ever get me my trade paperback, it'll be totally worth it. Wait, what trade paperback? If you signed up in the first, like, ten days, you would be eligible for a trade paperback thingy. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not that important. No, I'm not space anyway. <laughs> I'm a baby collector, but I still have a bit of space. All right. I want to give a, a big thank you, a big Christmas, Hanukkah, winter holiday thank you to all of our patrons, and especially for the ones who give to a certain level, which I will now read your names. Thank you to Lisa Slack, Donovan Morgan Grant, Austin Davis, Ian Miller, Stanton's Grave, Johnny McCloskey, Gerald Green, Donald Townsend, Cesar Diaz, Joshua Lappin Bertoni, Ed Grouse, Jessica Morales, Rob O, Captain America, David Richards, Tim Garassi, Mary Garrett, Robert Lewis, and Stephanie Mouse. Thank you all for supporting us, helping us to keep all of our episodes for this year and all the 13 years before it. And we hope to see you next time. This has been Ian. Hey, is this the, wait, wait, wait. Mm-hmm. We have one more issue before we close out the year. You're talking like we're, we're done. Only one more issue. Episode. I mean, one more episode. That too. <laughs> what are we covering in that last one? I mean, just as a quick preview for next week. Detective Comics. Uh, it's going to be Detective Comics. And always, as always, Greater Gotham. But I mean, the end of the year is kind of a, you know, lighter time because of the holidays. It's true. Which will be, I think, nice because we'll be pretty busy. Yeah, I might be editing on the airplane. I'm not sure. Wait, no, no. I'm not flying anywhere. Of course. Yes. Oh, good. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, that is that's hardcore. I'm going somewhere next month. So I might be recording sometime in January for my parents' basement again, which I've done a couple of times. Beth is a nerd. Nerd. Yeah, oh, dear. Doing nothing for Christmas. Not All right. <laughs> so, thank you for listening. This has been Ian. This is Dev. And this is the old stupid Mike. <laughs> uh, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. I have to be that was so hefty. That was it. We almost hit two hours. And I'm still recording while Steph is talking about having to pee. I have to pee so bad. Oh, uh, you should go do that. Um, Justice Society of America number one. Absurd. Same. Oh, I thought someone read this. No. Nope. Should have taken it off. I'll skip it. Um, 